This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build your website and run your online business. The films that Darren Aronofsky makes occupy an interesting space. They straddle a line between experimental and realist, between mainstream and independent, between classical biblical allegories and contemporary tales. However, what most of his films have in common is a strong emphasis on character and use of perspective to make the audience feel like they're taking a journey in the shoes of those characters, not just observing their story from afar as an outsider. As I do in this series of videos, I'll take a look at three different films made by Darren Aronofsky at three increasing budget levels, the low budget Pi, the medium budget The Wrestler, and the high budget Noah to identify commonalities in his filmmaking and how his style has progressed throughout his career. Aronofsky's introduction to filmmaking came from him studying social anthropology and filmmaking in 1991 at Harvard. His thesis short film for the program starred his friend and actor Sean Gallette. It was well received and won him a spot as a finalist at the 1991 Student Academy Awards. He went on to get his master's in directing from the AFI Conservatory where he met and began working with his classmate in the cinematography program, Matthew Libatik. When it came to writing Pi, like with many other low budget films, he decided to focus on a single character. This idea of doing a portrait character study was born out of the verite documentaries he would make in film school, which focused on the story of one person. The experimental horror film was set in only a few locations, with the primary one being inside a small apartment. The movie was financed through an early version of what I guess you would call crowdfunding. Aronofsky and his producer Eric Watson went around asking every friend, relative and acquaintance to give them $100 to fund their movie. Eventually they were able to raise $60,000 which, along with a host of other favours, was used to make the film. Some of those favours included getting the crew to work for deferred pay by granting them shares in the film which would pay out once the film was sold, paying the actors $75 a day, and getting a free warehouse which they could use to build their studio set. Around $24,000 of the budget went towards the cost of buying and developing 16 mil film stock, and much of the remaining funds were reserved for post-production. This left very little money for gear rental, production design or locations on the 28 day shoot. However, Liberty, who had photographed the film was granted enough to rent a Atten XDR 16mm camera, three lenses and a free, although small, tungsten lighting package to work with. He chose the XDR for its lightness which helped with the ample handheld work along with its ability to shoot single frames which they used for the stop motion board game scene. He got two 16mm cannon zooms, an 8-64mm and an 11.5-138mm and one Anjanew 5.9mm wide prime lens. To support a surrealistic look that Le Petit termed lo-fi stylization, Aronofsky decided to shoot Pi in black and white. Darren wanted to shoot Pi in black and white for both aesthetic and budgetary reasons. He wanted the most contrasty black and white possible with really white whites and really black blacks. To achieve this look, Libertique decided on using reversal film, Eastman Tri-X200 and Plus X50 for daylight scenes, which have high contrast but less dynamic range than negative film. The latitude the difference between the lightest and darkest part of the image was so small that he only had three stops before the highlights started blowing, which is difficult to comprehend when comparing to modern digital cinema cameras like the Alexa which can handle more than 14 stops of dynamic range. Libertique's lighting and metering of exposure had to be extremely precise as being even half a stop too bright might mean losing all detail. On top of that he used a yellow filter to further increase the contrast and get rich blacks. Their philosophy behind the look of the film was to create a subjective perspective that put the audience in the shoes of the protagonist. They did this by shooting with a single camera, shooting over the protagonist's shoulder and moving it in a motivated way, 
So when the character moved, the camera followed. To increase this personal perspective, they also used a macro lens at times to capture close details in an abstract way that also represented the character's gaze. A final example of his subjective perspective can be found in the stylized use of mounting a camera directly onto the actor's body, kind of like vlogging before the concept of vlogging existed. This gave a personal, up-close, subjective perspective that mimicked the increasingly manic movement of the character. They rigged a still photography tripod to a weight belt that was attached to the actor and mounted Aronofsky's own 16mm Bolex camera with a 10mm lens to the tripod. He altered the frame rates, over-cranking his close-up and under-cranking the camera at 12 frames per second for his point-of-view shots to show his increasing dissociation with the real world. Aronofsky spent the majority of the low budget on sound and post-production, where he was able to find additional funding, as he knew that without a strong sound design and mix, the film would fall flat. He was able to get a score from Clint Mansell, who, like the crew, worked for a deferred fee. He was therefore able to pull off Pi on an incredibly low budget by writing a story with limited locations, characters and no large set pieces, getting crew to work for deferred pay, pulling lots of favours and using a small gear package to create a vividly experimental, subjective, surrealist look. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. As a cinematographer, having an online portfolio of your work is a must. Squarespace provides the tools to easily build and manage your website or online store. Setting up a site on Squarespace is quick and intuitive. It guides you down the path of beautiful design, making the process of creating an aesthetically pleasing site easy. Their different website layouts allow you to effortlessly create a professional looking portfolio using customizable galleries that display your film work or stills. So check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash indepthcine to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or domain. After winning the directing award at Sundance Film Festival for Pi and selling it to distributor Artisan Entertainment for more than a million dollars, Aronofsky kick-started his feature film career. Following the bigger box office flop of The Fountain, Aronofsky picked up a lower budget script for his following film, a realistic portrayal of an aging wrestler written by Robert D. Siegel. He raised a budget of six million dollars to make the movie. After Nicolas Cage initially expressed interest in the role, it was eventually granted to Mickey Rourke. Although Rourke admired Aronofsky's work and wanted to make a film with him, he wasn't overly happy about the script, as he felt that some of the dialogue didn't accurately portray how his character would realistically talk. Therefore, he, along with Aronofsky, reworked much of the dialogue in the script until they were happy. Due to the free way that Rourke liked to work, Apparently around 40% of the final film was improvised and initially unscripted. So I tried to approach the film as free as possible. I didn't go on to set as I usually do with very specific uh, notes and shot lists. I tried to um, be open to every morning to what Mickey was going to bring and then try and figure out after I saw that the best way of capturing it. For example, most of the wrestling scenes were scheduled during real wrestling matches. The crew would wait till about halfway through a match and then bring Rourke into the ring and shoot a bit, using the real energy from the crowd who turned up. As it was very physically demanding, Rourke would then leave the ring, regather his energy and come back to shoot a bit more. During these breaks, the real wrestlers would keep the crowd entertained while Rourke recovered and the cameras were reloaded with new film stock. To capture this free way of working, Aronofsky devised a style and approach which both supported how he wanted to tell the story and which was practical. There's not much realism in the world of wrestling which is all about over-the-top performance, however the life of the main character in The Wrestler is too painfully real, so Aronofsky decided to create a film grounded in cinema verite, which followed his protagonist, literally, with an up-close and intimate handheld camera, again taking on a more subjective perspective. However, this time one that was far more centered around realism. 
To create this look, he hired cinematographer Maurice Alberti, who had a track record in both fiction and documentary work. They shot it on Super 16mm, which both suited the modest budget as it was cheaper to shoot than 35mm, but the grain from 16mm was also reminiscent of the verite documentary look they were going for. To create the look for this realistic portrait, Alberti shot almost entirely with natural light, mainly using whatever practical lighting was already in the locations. She would sometimes bring in a couple of lights or tweak them slightly in order to achieve exposure, but otherwise left the lighting alone whenever possible. The only exception was the final match, which was a built set. In this, she mimicked the lighting setups of many of the other matches which they had already shot, based around using overhead lights and lighting the four corners of the ring. Since most of the movie was assembled from long shot sequences photographed from the shoulder on a handheld camera, she chose the ARRI 416 for her camera operator, Peter Nolan. She paired the camera with a set of Zeiss Ultra 16 prime lenses and two Anjanu Optimo zooms, a 15 to 40 mm lightweight and a 28 to 76 mm. Due to the length of the takes, Peter Nolan came up with some interesting techniques for operating the camera. One involved strapping an apple box to his waist so that when he sat down with the camera during a take, he could rest his elbows on the apple box and hold the camera steady. Sometimes these long takes required plenty of choreography and involved grips holding up flags at various points to block out lights from casting shadows of the camera. So Aronofsky in some ways maintained his perspective of shooting the film in a subjective way, yet moved away from experimentation and more into realism. The wrestler's higher budget allowed Aronofsky to hire a cast of well-known actors for this performance-heavy drama and pay all the cast and crew fair rates. Yet they save money by shooting on 16mm in a rough verite documentary style which allowed them to work on real locations without any large production design, grip or electrical setups. The Wrestler proved to be both a critical and financial success. A few years later, he turned to producing a huge scope story which he'd been interested in since he was a child, the biblical story of Noah. True to his style, Aronofsky adopted Noah to the screen by straying from the brief source material and including a more surrealistic, allegorical story which visualized and presented themes through exaggerated characters and images. Producing such a large scope script with its epic set pieces required a hefty budget of around $160 million. Aronofsky turned to his regular DP Matthew Libertique to shoot the film. We were handheld on Noah, but it wasn't like we were floating from character to character in a verite style. I think we've matured as filmmakers and can focus on what's important, which is subjectivity and storytelling. But like on The Wrestler, Aronofsky wanted to be able to move the camera in a way that was very fluid and natural, but also in a way that was very controlled. Therefore, Libertique mainly used Aricam LT cameras, which were light enough for handheld work, yet were also tough enough to handle working outdoors in the elements for extended periods without breaking. With them, he selected Zeiss Ultra Primes, mainly sticking to three focal lengths, a wide 24mm, a medium 50mm, and a long 85mm. This time he shot on 35mm, a format with greater clarity and less grain, more suitable for an epic. Libertique shot in the higher resolution 4 per format for any shots that required post-production special effects, and in 3 per for regular scenes. Although most of the film was shot handheld with a single camera from a more subjective perspective, certain scenes such as the large flood scene was shot with 4 cameras two on Chapman hydroscope cranes and two on the ground to more quickly cover the many shots needed in this expensive set piece. The magical exteriors were also filmed on location in Iceland. When it came to lighting characters in those exteriors, not much was done except for trying to block scenes so that the actors could be backlit by the sun. Libertique likes to keep things as naturalistic as possible so avoids lighting exteriors whenever he can only using a muslin bounce occasionally when he needed more fill. As Libertique says, fighting nature to mimic nature is a large undertaking, 
However, some interiors and night scenes involved enormous setups. For example, to cover the battle scene at night, his team hung 18 daylight balanced helium balloons from condors, then two 100 ton cranes each carried 100 foot rain bars, and another 100 ton crane carried an 80 foot rain bar, with two 32k balloons on each rain bar. Another huge setup was the arc set, which was constructed in three levels in a studio in New York. Lighting such a big space came at a cost. For day scenes, the rigging grip built a giant white ceiling bounce made up of smaller ultra bounce surfaces. Bouncing into it were 20 20 gays, which they rigged on each side, under slung on the truss, and also 25 Mole Richardson 12 lights. Once production was wrapped, 14 months of post-production work began. During this time, Aronofsky tossed Industrial Light and Magic with extensive VFX work, including creating 99% of the animals in the film, dropping in background plates like mountains or trees, and of course, creating the mythical elements such as the watches. As with all of Aronofsky's films dating back to Pi, a score was composed by Clint Mansell. Noah was therefore produced on a blockbuster budget which was needed to create massive production design builds, enormous grip and lighting setups, a cast of stars, and enormous set pieces which required over a year of innovative visual effects work. Darren Aronofsky's filmography covers an interesting range all the way from low budget independently financed films up to large budget studio blockbusters. Despite this large growth in scale, his preference for visualizing themes and presenting them through characters using a subjective perspective has carried over throughout. While the maturity of his filmmaking might have grown, it maintains elements of original experimentation and an eye for the surreal that he's had since his earliest foray into cinema. Thanks for making it all the way through this episode and a special thanks to all the supporters of the channel on Patreon. Let me know what other directors you'd like to see featured in this series. Otherwise, until next time, thanks for watching and goodbye.